Hi, Zeus Alexander Samarov, beach volleyball player from Latvia, and you are listening to A Space. Hello there, and welcome back to the podcast where we interview the best players in world volleyball. Yes, it's the A Space, and we are absolutely thrilled to bring you a new episode this week. Louis Lett here with you today, and I will be the host on other occasions. It's Dave Rogers, and we'll be joined by the legends from the CEV, Matt or Dan. Once again, we have Dan Meanly with us. Danny boy, how are you? Louis, it's great to be back talking to you guys again. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to have one of the biggest volleyballing, yeah, knowledgeable brains that I know on this podcast. And shall we, uh, shall we get our guest back on? I, I think we should. I'm excited. Well, our newest co-host, as we said, I think we said an absolute weapon of the sport, didn't we? And we found out in the previous episode, not only is he a European champion, a world junior champion, multiple Olympian, et cetera, et cetera, could have been a wrestler, which would have been interesting, or a kickboxer. <laughs> also could have been a medic or a, or a doctor. He's, he's, point guard for the Lakers. Yeah, point guard for the Lakers. Yeah, that, that, could, that, could, be, that could be one. Um, and his other Samoyos, welcome back to the show, mate. Last time was so rad that I'm so happy we get to do this again. Hello again. It's, it's amazing to have you. How are you doing? How's that for you today? What's going on out there? Good. No rain. It's <laughs> pretty good weather, and uh, we had a practice today, so it was uh, really, really nice. No wind, and uh, just regular May. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to let you guys know that these episodes are being uh, released weekly alongside some of our other projects, um, and we are being uh, we're recording remotely due to the current situation. Latvia, London, and Luxembourg. How multicultural we are. Uh, remember, these are also released out to alternately with our unscripted and debate series as well. So today is all about over a decade at the top because you've had some career, Mr. Smoilov, seven years. You've been around for a while now. Um, so we're going to do... Uh, I think 16 uh, seasons. 16 seasons. Still enjoying it as much as you ever had? Yeah, for maximum. Still, like, uh, I have, like, uh, now... I have like a hangover about beach volleyball. <laughs> like, I like it's, it becomes an addiction. I think it's like, <laughs> yeah. and uh, yeah, you just uh, enjoying every, every tournament I play, every win uh, I, I get. And uh, I will try to play as long as I can because uh, I really love beach volleyball. Yeah, I can tell when I watch you play, you just get super fired up. You said in the last one that you're quite an emotional player, but that's why. I, Along with the style of game that you guys have had to play through the years, like I've also enjoyed watching you play because the fire that you uh, that, that you bring out there, which is it's great. And just coming, there. just coming natural, yes, uh, yeah. just, uh, And I think my nickname, Lion King, the uh, guitar, give me because I, the way I was playing, I was aggressive, I was uh, screaming when I was uh, scoring an important point and. Um, that's a way, my way to explore the mo emotions. Yeah, I, I, and you're still, you're still that guy, which is, which is awesome because it's seven, 17 years of playing and you're still, you still got that emotion, which is, which is great. How long, um, can you remember your first event and can you remember how, like how it felt at that time and where it was, your first FIBB? My first FIBB was 2000, uh, like World Tour, uh, was 2005. Uh, in Stare Blanki in Poland, it was an amazing location next to the in, in the forest next to the lake, and uh, so we came. We had zero points, and uh, we had to play two rounds of country quota. Then we had to play three rounds of qualification, and then we qualified for a main draw in a, my, uh, my first world tour. And uh, first round we had to play against uh, Reckerman Dickman. They were number one in the world ranking. And oh, Pokemon became Olympic champion later. Oh, yeah, and it was and we had a chance to win a set. And I was like still remember how it was. And uh, it was we were leading 2019 and uh, we served, they make a set too wide, and Dickman attack and the ball hit antenna and then my hands. So we celebrated, we went in a seat, and then Reckerman and Dickman back in the days you were able to talk with the referee a lot. So wow. we're like five minutes talking with the referee. We are sitting and understanding what's happening. We want to set what they're talking about. 
And so referee called me back and said, no, ball hit your hands and then antenna. So it's 2020. Oh, <laughs> like, what? No, 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 no. Uh, so it was, it was a nice experience and it was, it was the beginning of uh, my career. And then um, at the end of the year, we won under 21 world championship. And uh, when you win world championship uh, underage, you get a wild card for uh, adult uh, world tour. And so next year we started with, uh, with Montreal, I think, and we get a wild card. Yeah, and then we get our first win in, uh, in the main draw. And so then we started to play tournament by tournament. I, I can't believe, because I was going to ask, like, you know, first World Tour event, you must be feeling like a bit vulnerable, a bit nervous. But I'm not, yeah, I don't think that's the case with you, because if you go and make a, if you go and make a main draw and then almost beat the number one seeds, you, you're not really feeling nervous, are you? Like, you're, you're just taking it off. I think you, at that moment, because it happens so fast, I think the uh, other thing when you're playing like qualification, you lose, lose, and when finally you qualify for a main draw, then probably you will have a pressure. But when it's happening like in, in one, two days, you don't even like realize till the end what's happening. Maybe next day I was, we were sitting and said like, there are Latvian teams who are ready for 15 years going to the world tour and qualify maybe once in the 10 years. <laughs> in, we in our first tournament we went and we qualified and it also was because of my father because all the teams in the Latin Beach Volleyball before us before Plavin Samoylos they were training for them was there were indoor players who was just playing at the beach so for them training was okay we just go to the beach and play or play side out they never did drills they never do exercises and we're the we were the first team who was doing drills exercising six months a year just beach volleyball not just playing beach volleyball as for fun outside your uh, indoor career and when we started to play my father always said like we need to qualify for olympics and you can and you know, like realize how crazy it was when uh, latvian teams like in 10 years qualified only once for a main draw, and then uh, coach comes and says that we need to qualify for Olympics. Even main draw was something unrealistic, but Olympics, it was like a different planet. And when uh, Plavins came to his, he was a libero in the indoor club. So he came to his, uh, to the game. And after the game in the changing room, he said, like uh, Samarilov's uh, coach said that uh, we need to qualify for Beijing Olympics. And all the clubs started to laugh. He said, like, <laughs> crazy, like, like, how can you qualify? And so, but he puts, like, since uh, we were 18, so every practice he was putting this, that we need to qualify for Olympics. We need, we need to work harder. And he was always telling that when he was in Spain, he played with Brazilian guy. And they won Spanish championship. And this Brazilian guy came and said, okay, we won Spanish, uh, like, tour. But if we would play in Brazil, we would be number 20. Because there are people who are living at the beach and they call called Rata de Playa, uh, beach rats. And so my father was saying to beat these guys, like Rata de Playa who live at the beach. Uh, so we need to uh, work and train uh, more than they. And we need to be stronger and more clever than they. So this is the only way how we can beat them. So this was like since my first day in Beach Volvo, so it was on repeat in my head. And that's why I think like, we're just, just going step by step uh, to this dream. And what did you think at the beginning? Did you believe, you know, when your dad first said, we're going to qualify for the Olympics, were you like, yeah, yeah, I think that's like I you... said, Like I said in previous episodes, he made me to believe. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, 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 that's it's, it is almost unbelievable though, right? From where Latvian, because I'm from England, I love beach volleyball, but to, to see where that hops come from, from Latvia, like, would you say that, um, is your father sort of responsible for Yanis and for Martins and for everybody else coming through as well and coaching them? Yeah, so actually he's number one coach. Uh, he's the only beach volleyball coach now in, uh, in Latvia. So uh, with, uh, with Smedin's brothers, their father also was their coach. So he was a setter in the USSR junior national team. Yeah. And uh, so he was like, at the beginning, he was a coach of uh, Smedin's brothers. But... Um, 
I started with Plavins and my father was a coach. And uh, so currently, like last year, my father was the coach of uh, Samuel Smedins. So he was a coach of uh, Plavins Tots. And he also is already, he was like three years a coach of uh, our uh, ladies team, Graudina Kravchanenka, who qualified to Tokyo with qualification tournament. And he's also a coach of my brother and his partner. So he had four teams and he is crazy. Like he is working six days a week, eight hours. So he's coming to the beach. So like one team coming, like two teams coming, and they're leaving, another two teams coming. So we are bringing food for him. He's eating lunch uh, at the beach. So he's fanatic. He's like, for him, he's saying what he needs. He needs uh, beach volleyball, and this is all what he needs in life. So he can he can play and live with beach volleyball. He's still playing every second day. So he finished coaching, and he go and play with the guys, with local guys. You can see where you get it from, though, right? And where all the other players get it from this this work ethic and this commitment, and something that's really shining through the the whole way is how committed you are and how hard you guys have worked to get to where you had to get to is, is crazy. No, I think it's great when family is involved in, the, in sport, like the same now with uh, mall family, like all family, like playing beach volleyball, parents and all kids. And it's, this is a key for success. Like when, uh, when you, all your family, because when you're alone, it's much harder. And, uh, but when you're all your family supporting you in uh, what you are doing, it's much easier easier you feel a support because when you start to succeed usually like all people around you they're like okay uh, it's cool yeah but it's like keeping distance automatically and uh, it was always I was asking I was talking with German I remember this uh, talk when I was 20 years old and I asked uh, German guys like uh, players like uh, why all the players and the world, uh, like on the underage, don't like Germans. He said, like, because the Germans dominating in the junior tournaments, and uh, and then I realized it's 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 it is like this. And when you start to succeed, and people, I don't know why, automatically like getting away from you. Well, when you have family supporting you, it's really good. They didn't they didn't dominate the world in, in the under twenty one championships in two thousand and five. <laughs> but they were really strong. <laughs> that, that was that wasn't run by that, yeah that wasn't run by by, by Germany whatsoever. You, you mentioned yeah, beforehand, about, but they beat us year before. They beat us year before. <laughs> yeah, I look back through the uh, look back through the draws actually. Um, what was the difference in two thousand and five? I mean, it wasn't an easy draw. You played Pedro and Thiago like in Brazil. Like that's, that's and Bruno and Bruno yeah. in Rio. We and played yeah, in the pool with Bruno. And you had Bruno in the pool, like. What was the turning point for you guys? Like, what was it that was like, we're going to go beat Brazil twice, like, easy? We were, we were in a really, really good shape. Like, uh, that year, we were so motivated because also we won, because of the World Tour, when we qualified for a main draw, we realized it, like, our power. We realized, and it was, it was like, when we qualified for a main draw in Sarri Blanqui, so it got, extra motivation for us and Rio was one month after uh, after the uh, Starry Blanqui and so we were on the wave so we feel okay like if we can beat adults so for juniors uh, we will be unstoppable and so we, we came with the thoughts that we need so we came to the tournament with a with the thoughts in our heads that we must win this tournament and uh, also we because we won under 20 European Championship the year before so it was from so we were going and planning when we see a draw we were looking at the draw in the tournament we were looking till the final who we have to play so there wasn't any other thoughts that uh, fifths to get fifths or uh, quarterfinal or semifinal so it was and uh, yeah it was tough for sure that we had to play Pedro in the semifinal but it was it was a good match and uh, really happy that we won we are good friends with Pedro and Pedro is like always were saying to me like this game in my hometown with all my family all my friends and a stadium and you beat me and after and after uh and this year when we had uh, we had training camp in rio and uh we had dinner with him he invited us to his place he made a steaks me and yanis and he said 
So after Rio Olympics, when he beat me in Rio, so he said, okay, now we are 1-1. <laughs> so, <laughs> could, could you imagine, like, you beat Pedro in Pedro's hometown, and Pedro comes from a massive beach volleyball family. Like, he, he, he comes here, yeah, he has a beach volleyball family too, so, yeah, wow. Like, Even bigger than mine, yeah, he's like... Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Well, you have a pretty, pretty impressive beach volleyball family as well. Fast forward 2008, we've spoken about this before. You go to Beijing, um, you've already spoken about what a big deal this is for Latvia to make an Olympic Games. But you look at the draw and you've got Phil, Phil and Todd in the first, yeah, like first game. What you, you said, you, you walk out, you said in the previous episode, you walk out, lights, cheerleaders, you, you've got Peter throwing it out on the mic, like, it's good. But what are you feeling like sports-wise going into that game? So, uh, as, I, as I told you before, that for us, we were the youngest team who qualified to Olympics. We were the last team who qualified. And when we qualified for Beijing, we would just breeze out. And for us, was, we've done everything we wanted. So, our, our uh, goal was to qualify. And then the rest, we said, like, okay, we'll just enjoy. And uh, when year before we played against Dalhauser before the match, we said, like, why everybody hitting into his block? Like... <laughs> He's putting like 10 boxes, like how can you be? And we said, we were sitting, it was in for, uh, Fortaleza, we sit and we said like, to my father, said, okay coach, now we will show how you need to hit against Dalhauser. Come and watch this. So we warm up, we started to play and it was four blocks in a row. We started zero four and my father was sitting in the stadium and started to laugh really, really loud. He started to laugh and they just destroyed us. We scored, I think we scored less than 21 points in two sets in total. <laughs> and uh, so when the first game was, uh, when the first game was uh, in the Beijing, so me and uh, Flames, we were sitting in the uh, Olympic Village and said, okay, let's try to get at least 15 points in every set because everybody will watch this in Latvia. Everybody will watch because it was really good timing also for Latvia. And it was the first uh, sport event uh, for the Latvian uh, Olympic team. And he said, like, let's just get 15, minimum 15 teams in every set so we don't feel shy after the game. And so we just went and we had no pressure. So we were fighting for every point to get these 15 points. And then we managed to get 21. We won 21, 19. And we were, like, celebrating this set, the victory, like we won a tournament. So we were running around the court and hugging each other. And uh, yeah, so it was uh, fun. And uh, so at the beginning, like first two games, it was just enjoying. And when we realized that last game, we play against Switzerland and uh, Heuscher Heyer, Heuscher was a bronze medalist already of Olympic Games. And we realized that if we win, we are, number, we are first in our pool. And if we lose, we are last in our pool and we are out of Olympics. And then in this game, I was going uh, by shout out to the game and my hands were shaking for one hour. I couldn't control. We were talking about weather. I was saying it's a really nice weather and uh, here in Latvia and then it started to rain. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> now I feel like, uh, now I feel like uh, in, uh, in London. <laughs> what did you, I, mean, it's, I don't want to show you the weather here today, but it is, it's beautiful, very rarely. Uh... Yeah, very good. Is it okay if I, if I sit with umbrella like this? It's perfect. It brings, it's fine with you, yeah. Brings, brings some character. Um, how did you, like, what did you learn from that first Olympics? Like, did it clarify any thoughts from you? Did it, it told you it was on a great path, but... From that Olympic, I learned that everything is possible during Olympics. Because I've seen, because it's so stressful event, like emotions, because usually like in professional sport, emotions are really important part of a sport because uh, I've seen hundreds of people who are really, really good during trainings and during practice and they just couldn't get their level, their highest level during competition. So in the Olympics, it's all multiples, like by five times. I've seen Emmanuel in London when uh, like, Iron Felix, who have never, I never seen uh, during World Tour, he's stressful or he's not confident during the game. 
and I've seen him shaking during uh, Olympics in London because this is an event that I think if we look from a sport part, world championship is much stronger than Olympics because there is a limit of uh, two teams per country. So there are multiple of good uh, teams who are not in Olympics. And uh, maybe now it's not that uh, how it was like 10 years ago because now a lot of countries have strong teams. And back in the day, there was in the top 20, there was six Brazilians, uh, five American teams. So for them, there's these two teams limit, like really decrease the level of uh, Olympics. And they're also because of from every continent uh, limit. So I would say from sporting size that uh, Olympic Games are a little bit weaker than World Championship. But because media attention is so huge and the pressure from media, from uh, Olympic team, from society in your country, because all, all the people like are talking, it's uh, Olympics, it's sports that uh, housekeepers, uh, like uh, all the regular people are watching. Like my mom, she wasn't in the sport, but she always watched Olympics. So I think it was the majority of people, even if they're not following sports, they watch Olympics. So the attention and the pressure of this event makes uh, it so much difficult to control your emotions. And uh, that's why... In the Olympics, everything is possible, especially for like young people. They, if they just enjoy and play freely, they can achieve a lot. We, we were talking to uh, Lara Ludwig was on the on the podcast as well, and we were just talking about that achievement for Kira Volkenhorst to win the Olympic Games at, at her first Olympic Games. It's it's just crazy, right? Like you, you think about the people who win the Olympics at their first Olympics, and it's just <laughs> yeah. I, it blows my mind every time. But she's amazing, yeah. Like, her mentality, like, winner's mentality is crazy. I'm a pretty good friend with uh, Alex Falkenhorst. He's mm -hmm. always, uh, every year already, like, for seven years, he's coming to be, uh, our camps in Egypt, in our uh, training base. And uh, <clears throat> so we're in a really good relationship. And he said, like, yeah. My, you just don't know my sister. Like nobody knows my sister, how she's competitive and how is in her head she's like dominating over uh, the other. Like in her mentality, like since she was a child, she was always thinking about herself as a winner and uh, just a winner mentality, and that's why she succeeds. Wow. How do you deal with the nerves of Olympics? You know, like how's how do you? Is there any sort of special thing you use, a psychologist or any skills to help you deal with the nerves on the big stage? I, I think I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing because that's why you can see my results. <laughs> so it's uh, oh, a place to improve. You've won in Moscow this year. Like you, you can't, <laughs> yeah, like you can't say that. Like that's, yeah, like I don't believe it for a minute. Yeah, it's uh Mental work, I mean, if you talk about the Olympics, like, uh, till now, I couldn't handle this pressure. Uh, I was, I, I can't control, like, I'm, I'm still, like, trying, like, to maybe to be more calm or to be more aggressive or to be more emotional or to be, like, more calm and uh, more to depress my emotions and uh, to how, how to play on a, uh, my, my best level. And um, for sure, in uh, Beijing and London, I wasn't in the shape to get a medal. Obviously, like if you look like from like per, per technique and physical abilities, but in Rio for sure, we were in a condition with Yanis. We were, we were going for gold. And I think we just, uh, we didn't handle the pressure because when we were going to the airport, uh, like all our fan base and all the society and Olympic teams, they were like saying, okay, just go and take this gold medal. So. They were sending us to Rio to get and bring this gold medal. So it was like a, only one goal. And so I think it was a little bit too much for us. And I think a big, uh, big mistake was for me to stay in Olympic Village with all the rest Olympic team, because we had a lot of young, uh, young athletes who was first time in Olympics. And uh, they were getting crazy. Their emotions uncontrolled, how they're getting, how they're happy. 
how they are sad, how they are stressful, and all this happening inside your, your building. Like all the time you come uh, contact with these people and they're coming every time and coming with their emotions. Some are really, really sad, some are shaking, and some are just jumping from happiness because they won their first uh, game or stuff like this. And uh, so I think it was a big mistake. It, I had better to stay maybe closer to the, to the court. Also from uh, Olympic Village to, to the courts, it took like one hour and a half to go to, to the courts. So I think it was that, that was all these things that uh, didn't uh, allow us to show a good result. Staying away from the, um, like staying away from the village is something that a lot of people do. And you can completely understand why if you want to stay, if you want to keep everything as normal as possible, putting you around yeah. the, the like 20,000 athletes, <laughs> Uh, unlimited food and unlimited everything is is maybe not always the, yeah because uh, it's uh, completely different like in the world tour what uh, what routine you have when you're on the world tour and completely different when you come uh, for olympics and so this will also like usually in the world tour we have competition four days yeah two two three games a day and then like boom 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 tournament is over but here it's like you have a game and then if you win then you have almost two days to to live with this uh, positive emotion, with all this media calling you, writing, and every in the Olympic Village, every athlete of your team comes and say, "Yeah, well done, nice game." And so it's uh, it's harder to just to stay focused on uh, on what you're doing and stay in this routine. You are usually in the world tour, and uh, okay, also you've got, you've got another couple left in you, mate. So you, you're gonna go again, right? So yeah, for sure. I, I'm aiming to at least. <laughs> Just um, just quickly after uh, I'm I'm interested after that Olympic um in 2008, you and Martins uh, separated for the time for the time being. What was the decision behind that? Do you mind sharing it? Like it's after a very successful period. Like it's it's interesting that you you, you separated. Uh, actually, it was uh, as I told before in previous episodes that uh, my father is a really strict person. So he's like, uh, I would say, like a general in the army. So we had like our preparation was like for soldiers in the army. So really, really strict. And uh, so he was also very aggressive after we were losing. So he came with very aggressive emotions and he was like always like screaming. He completely changed now. But uh, before when we just started, he was also for him, he was like his coaching experience. We were growing as an athlete and he was growing as a coach. We, it was for us was first world tour and for him it was also first world tour as a coach so he was also learning and uh, how so he was first step for him and uh, i think just martin couldn't uh, handle with him uh, he couldn't handle this pressure anymore since he was tired and uh, they had a conflict and that was just between them and uh, at the beginning of a year we had some bad results we like Three tournaments in a row, we got 25th, so we were losing in the uh, main draw, but we really needed good results. And so Martin, he said, like, okay, I'm stopped. We had no chance to qualify to Beijing, and I'm not uh, playing uh, with you anymore. And then uh, Olympic Committee and Federation came together, and they said, okay, no, if you even have one little uh, percentage to qualify to Beijing, you have to do this because we invested pretty a lot the support in you, finance in you, and you need to do this. So we took another coach, so who can be the like coach assistant, who can also uh, help a little bit us uh, for this. And uh, this coach, uh, Iger Birzelis, he, he, he became a coach of Plavin Smedins, and he was their coach when they got the bronze in uh, London. Uh, so actually, yeah, so we took him into world uh, world tour level so we bring him and then he he working together with my father so he developed as a coach uh, as well and uh, so actually this idea so i said we knew in the beijing we knew with plavin that we gonna split we knew that we're gonna split and he agreed with another guy to play yeah. with italnex a guy from his indoor club and i agree with sorokins with who i played in london so we agreed and when we get to Beijing and we had a really good result, after Beijing, uh, Martin asked me, okay, maybe we continue to play together because we did pretty good and we can get good sponsors now. 
But I said, no, sorry, I already shake hands with uh, Sorokins and uh, I will play with him uh, till was there, uh, London. Was there a conflict after that? Like, did you, was there a rivalry between, between you guys? No, or? not at all. Not at all, not any conflict. And uh, also, like, I never had a conflict with Plavins. And always, when uh, I had the chance, when my partner was injured, uh, I was playing with him. The same what's happened with uh, when Yanis got injured, when he had meniscus surgery in uh, 2016, I think. 15, 2015, I played the World Championship in the uh, Netherlands with Plavins. And the same when Yanis got injured uh, two years ago when he fell from bicycle and dislocated his <laughs> shoulder. And uh, I played with Plavins in the King of a Court uh, event. I just think you guys are going to look, you guys, like all of you, in, when this is over, you're going to look back at each other and you're going to be like, what, the, what did we achieve? <laughs> like, it's amazing. When you think of it yeah, like it this, is. like how it's worked out and how it how it's all that, it's incredible. What, yeah, what good. But what's a good thing that we had? We still stayed. We separate. We had one good team, and then we split. And uh, Plavins he tried with this indoor guy, but it didn't work. And then he uh, started to play with uh, Smedins, with Yanis, and I played with Sorokins. And then we had one good team who qualified to Benjik, and then we split, and we, we made two teams who and now two teams uh, qualified uh, to London. And uh, also it was really good. We had really strong uh, competition inside. And all our Sasha team in Latvia also, there were like two camps. One is uh, cheering for uh, Somalo Sorokins and one team is uh, cheering for Plavin Smedins. And the fans fighting with each other when we're playing on the stadium, like one, co one half course, they're cheering for them, another half for other. When they're going to the world tour, uh, also the people, like more and more people were getting involved and the beach volleyball was growing and growing and more people were coming into beach volleyball. And now, this rivalry, it was really nice. And this is rivalry what's happening now. Me and Yanis against uh, Plavins and Tots as well. And it's really good for us that they qualified to Olympics. Like from one uh, side, like if we talk about... Uh, sport part like for sponsors and also for our fans it's like really that we are under pressure but from the other side we are super motivated now because they already qualified for olympics but we have some business to do yet and uh that's why we are really motivated and in training camps we are working really hard and this uh bring extra motivation for us to become a better player it's, it's a great story like the, the recipe like this is why i love sport and why i love like doing things like this as well is is hearing the reasons why things are successful and the fact that you're all so close. How did it come, so, so after London, um, how did it come around that you and Yanis then went, okay, it's, it's us? Like, what was, the, what was the thought process then? And, and how come there was another reshuffle? It was a very funny story. Uh, in Latvia, they call it parent meeting, like in <laughs> school, uh, because my father, met with uh, Yanis' father yeah. and they agree, okay, let's after London put our uh, boys together because in this case, we can start winning medals because before when I was playing with Sorokins, we had only one medal, it was silver in the world tour and uh, Plavins and Smedins, they also had only one uh, medal on the world tour. So our father said, okay, let's put our sons together and uh, then they will have a chance to get medals on the world tour. And the problem was that uh, me and Yanis, we were so competitive uh, on, on the court against each other because we never played together. We always were fighting against each other. And we, because he is uh, also fire and he's introvert, but he's also very. Yeah, I was, was going to say that. Yeah, he's like. I, I think of you as like being fire and ice. Like he's ice and fire, but, <laughs> but I don't think that's the case, obviously. You, you know, he's a fire. He's, 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 he's bo born in, April, in uh, August, uh, uh, no, so in end of July. And so he is in the Harris Cup, he is lion. So we are two lions. I'm Lion King and he's lion in the Harris Cup. I'm the same birthday round yeah. Maybe that explains yeah. and, uh, and the problem is I never even, when we were traveling, when we were 20 years old, we traveled by car on the world tour by cars. And once we almost had a fight with him, <laughs> like real fight, not like talking fight, but like uh, almost fighting. We start grabbing each other and almost like hitting each other. We were 20 years old. And uh, after this, our like 
call like our relationship was like cold as ice so and even when i played with uh Sorokin, like he played with plowins we were sitting at the same table eating very often and we never talked to each other <laughs> so <laughs> it was always it, it was it, always i talk with Sorokins <laughs> and i talk with plowins and he talked with plowins and talked with Sorokin, and never like to each other and it was always big hey. big fights on the court and during trainings when we uh, had sparring matches and when our fathers had a meeting they agree so the media gets some also information so information like gossips and all and then the, all the society started to talk about these that uh, Smed and Samoa was going to play after London they're going to play together and then we played two weeks before London there was a tournament in Berlin we played against each other and after the game, Plavins and Sorokins, they went to the doping control. And me and uh, Yanis have stayed in the player's area, so we went for them. And this is the first time, two weeks before London, I came to him. I came to him and said, it's so funny that all society, like Beach Volleyball Society in Latvia, they talk that we're going to play with each other after London. But we never talk about this and we never talk about uh, with you. And he started to laugh, yeah. <laughs> and then the, how it's happened and then in London they get bronze and I said to my father so probably they will stay together as a team and uh, after London there was a tournament in Stary Blonki in Poland and we went there and we <laughs> had a dinner uh, with me my father uh, Yanis and uh, his father and uh, we just sit and said no no no, no. we we had an agreement and Lon uh, olympics is just won a tournament but we want to stay consistent like good uh, like every single tournament not one tournament a year and we all four you know, like in movies we put four hands together and we made a deal and uh, we made our team That's and then next year we become number one in world ranking it's like a movie moment there <laughs> a movie moment, but like a movie story of like two guys who didn't really want to talk to each other all of a sudden had a career like this together. It's just like, wow. How do you get on now? Like, do you get on really well? Is it like a real good relationship? I yeah, mean, I'm, uh, I'm really surprised. Like everybody was saying, okay, they're individuals, they're really good players, but we will see how they can uh, communicate with each other. It's also national part also coming because uh, I came from uh, my family because when it was USSR, like all countries were together and my, par my parents, they were studying in the middle of Russia and then they came to Latvia to study and they stayed in Latvia. So they actually, they're like, they came like Russians and uh, Yanis, he's from a most uh, nationalistic uh, part of Latvia. And uh, so it was always, also national, like uh, Russian and Latvian. How, how are we gonna that's communicate that's with each other like uh, from a na national part? But it didn't work, it worked really good. And uh, we never had any conflict uh, about this uh, with Yanis. And outside the court, we have really good relationship. Okay, we are not like friends, but uh, we're, we're dealing really good. That's awesome. It doesn't have to be, right? Like it's, uh, it's different playing volleyball and it's crazy. You have to spend all your time with, with minimal people. And it, it's, it's not like a team sport where, like a big team sport where I can talk to, if I'm in English football, I can talk to Harry Kane one minute, or I can go and talk to the goalkeeper or the right back or, or whoever. Yeah. Like it, it's, you have no, you're very much confined to that. Um, Dan, any other questions before we get on with the features? Um, no, I think we can go right into uh, our feature here, top five. So you've had, you've had quite a long career, managed to stay, you know, at, playing at a really high level for a really long time, which is great. We're wondering if you had five tips for our listeners to stay fit and healthy throughout your entire career. It can be something as specific as a, a food to eat or a specific exercise or, or physiotherapy you do. Totally uh, I didn't do something. Uh, it was my homework. He sent the, uh, thanks for sending me this question. It was a little bit easier. So it's not like something specific. It's more like general things, but maybe just yeah. uh, what people maybe not think uh, a lot. So first is for sure is taking care of your body. And taking care of your body is not only like proper sleep or uh, food, what you eat and drink w enough water. I think it's so obvious, but uh, really important is uh, in your preparation system, how you prepare your body. Because most of the 
popular question I get in my Instagram direct messages is like how to improve my vertical jump. And what I'm answering people is like, it's not like you start to do deadlift or squats and you improve your jump. Okay, you maybe improve your jump, but you will uh, jump for how many years? You'll jump, uh, yeah, one, one, once professor came to, one professor came to my father and said, I have developed the program then when you can improve your jump for, by uh, 20 centimeters. And my father asked, uh, and for how many years he will be able to jump like this? And then this professor said, um, I didn't think about this question. <laughs> so the idea is, uh, and that what all my, my father always was telling, the idea for me is not like to get the result just now. And then uh, I don't care what's happening with you later. He said, I need you for many, many years. And so the preparation, how you prepare with the deep muscles, will prepare your ligaments, your joints. It's uh, so, so important to develop on the highest level. And usually in off season with what the regular people and all fans that don't realize that off season, we are working really, really long or our body, or our physical preparation without the balls in the gym, with the bands, with small weights, with our body, just to be able then for five months to play on the highest level. You need like five, six months to prepare your body to play on the highest level. Because if you just get a good shape and play, if you're 20, 20, 25, okay, it works good. If you're 30 plus, then your body will say, no, 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 stop. And you will start to have injuries. So it's really important thing just to prepare your body for uh, intensive uh, work. So it's not just about squatting 150 kilograms. You have to you have to work on the muscles. Every, every stability, yeah. stability of your of your body. Yeah. Uh, okay. I went through a stage where I just tried to lift as much as possible, and <laughs> yeah, we all make that mistake. We all make that mistake. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't very functional. Let's put it that way. Yeah. It's it's uh, it will be much better if you lift 100 kilo kilograms but do it properly, you'll have much better result for your beach volleyball uh, skills rather than uh, squat with uh, and push uh, 150, but do it incorrectly. Yeah, you'll, you'll get, Okay, you'll this is number one. Number two, <laughs> number two. For sure, everybody knows that warm up is important. But as I develop through all my careers, that cool down is even more important than warm up. I always do cool down after every, it's a training or a, or a game straight after world tour game my game is over i go maybe do some pictures with my fans five minutes interview and then straight i go to warm up courts and do cool down and first of all this uh, your recovery really speed up your recovery and uh, also your body and uh, you have much much uh, less uh, injuries when you do proper cool down after uh, your physical activity you because usually i know like people warm up okay i will do warm up something not to get injury during my exercise but after training is over bye bye shower yes. and home unless you're in the usa where quite a few people in the usa just warm up a little bit like <laughs> still just throwing. i was the same i was the same Warm up yeah, shoulder, yeah. let's go. I'm ready. <laughs> um, number three. Number three, enjoy the game and um, not to make it as a routine. I think it's the worst to extend your career because I know so many players, they finish their career because they, would get, they just get tired of beach volleyball. Because for many players, it becomes work. When you start playing beach volleyball or any other activity or other sport, when you start doing this as a work, say, okay, I need to work because I need to get uh, earn money and because I need to uh, get sponsors and this is how I get money for living. And when you start doing this as a work and not enjoying the process, you wouldn't succeed and you wouldn't be able to do this for a long period of time. That's, that's, Number four. That's, that's an eight, yeah, like I couldn't agree more. That's, that's really Number cool. four. Uh, traveling. This is a huge part of uh, beach volleyball. And uh, I know many players who finish their career when they were 30 years old because they said, I'm just tired of traveling. I'm just tired of being away from home. 
And I think it's really important if you can get maximum out of traveling and if you can find the good things in traveling and not to think, oh, okay, I spent, like last year, I spent 250 days a year away from, uh, from my home. But if you manage to, if you know how to communicate with people, if you find new people, new contacts, if you get spend not all the time in a airport, hotel, court, hotel, court, that what usually happen in the world tour. But if you find like there is so much nice places, so much nice things. And if you during your travel, you manage, enjoy the process. For example, I, I can't sleep in a plane, but that's how I started to read books. Okay, I started to read books, you get new information, or you study my, I write it my master degree, 90% of my master degree, I write it in an airplane. <laughs> because this was a place where I can stay silent, there is no internet, so I can stay focused and, uh, and write. So oh, no, when you I can find in the traveling, when you can find in the traveling good things that you can use the traveling as advantage, then you will also, it wouldn't be that uh, hard for you to travel so much and spare away so much time away from your home. So this is number four. Try to make traveling uh, enjoy also. And number five, uh, I put nutrition. And nutrition is not more like food, but uh, supplements. Because us, as we all fair play, we all take only legal supplements because we have doping control usually like six, eight uh, times uh, a year. But uh, what I always figured, like as less as better. I try not to take uh, supplements as longer as I can in my career, because I believe that until you are 25, 27, it's enough you eat a burger and uh, you, uh, the apple and a banana and you get the uh, maximum out of this. And for sure, as you get older, it's harder for you to play on the highest level without uh, any like protein uh, and all this. Uh, all. Yes. <laughs> yeah, That's but okay. Fun. Fish, fish oil, fish oil. That's I'm giving fish my oil kids. That the whole my world. kids are three and five, and I'm giving the fish oil. I'm talking about something more stronger. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that is still legal, but uh, much stronger. Like. Uh, uh, stronger supplements that improve your skills, improve your abilities. You can uh, improve your endurance, your strength, your muscle growth, and your uh, maybe your concentration uh, uh, abilities. So all his nutrition, try to use them as, 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 as later as later as possible. So this will be like extra bonus for you when you uh, you feel that with uh, you start losing, for example, like endurance or power. And you add this uh, nutrition and you can extend your, uh, improve your abilities. And also when you're out, out, out of competition and off season, I've tried to not to uh, use any supplements to get clean. So when I'm, my competition starts, it gets a uh, much uh, bigger effect. Wow. Okay, so some good tips there. Um, that's all we've got time for, for this episode of the A-Space. It's been an absolute pleasure, Lion King, to hear about your decade at the top. Um, it really is fascinating to hear about your adventures, but also your relationship with Yanis and that whole sort of pathway through all the three Olympic Games. So thank you for, for coming on. It's Thanks for writing. Enjoying this. And Dan, the volleyball like mastermind over there, thank you very much, mate. You must have had another great time. Yep, yep. It was a great, great episode. Great episode. It's, it's awesome. So listeners, make sure you're subscribed and tell your friends. Suggest guests. You can send in questions. Remember, we're everywhere. Spotify, we're up. Anywhere you find your, your podcast, you will find us up and about now. My name has been Louis Lett. This has been the A-Space uh, from the CEV. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to having you along next time. <laughs>